Welcome to Functional Philosophy. I'm Charles Two. That's T as in tango, E as in echo, and W as in whiskey. This is episode number 33, and its title is The False Theory of Self-Ownership. Howdy howdy everyone. I think I have mentioned this subject before. I think in my commentary on Sargon and Rucka's discussion of objectivism and Ayn Rand. As I do more episodes, as I'm getting into the 30s, uh, it's becoming more difficult to remember what I have done and what I haven't, especially because some of my episode titles are not straightforward. So I hope I don't do anything redundant ever. This will become more and more difficult as time goes on. Hopefully... At some point, I will remember, you know, as, as I start to record an episode on something, I'll remember whether I've done it. It will seem familiar. The problem with that is I do a lot of fake explaining, explaining to an imaginary audience. So I have memories of explaining all kinds of things that I haven't done on the show. So this is going to be quite difficult. If I ever do anything twice or multiple times, then... Hopefully I'll have something new to say <laughs> uh, each time. In any case, so the false theory of self-ownership. Many people believe, including many libertarians and classical liberals, Sargon is infatuated with this view, that the right to liberty, that freedom itself derives from one's property right to oneself. This is profoundly false and disastrous. So let's trace out the consequences here. I'm going to explain why this is wrong, what the right view is, and what the disastrous consequences are, because this matters. So let's start with the truth. The truth is that rights come from the fact that in a social setting, a certain sphere of action must be protected and respected if one is to survive, if one is to continue to exist. Rights come from the fact that life is the ultimate standard of value. Everything flows from life. So life is the foundation. So in a social setting, we have to see what is required if people are to live together in order to protect life, in order to allow people to exist. Now, the answer to this is liberty, freedom. People need to be free in order to act on their own judgment, in order to think and then act on the basis of that thought. So no thought crimes, number one, and no restrictions on actions, unless those actions restrict other people's ability to think and act. And this is the only way you can have rights. Rights are naturally bounded. Your rights end exactly where another person's begin. And there's no question of that. The only obligation your rights place on anybody else is for them to respect your rights, which is just a form of their respecting their own rights. I did a show on this, Ben Shapiro, and the secular case for human rights. But now we're talking about the hierarchy of specific rights. So the right to life comes first. Then you have the right to liberty, because thinking and acting on your own judgment is how you support your own life. In fact, the more other people do things for you, the less alive you are. If people think for you, you will become an animal, because you won't have to use abstract thought. So you won't get the higher emotional pleasures of life. And if people act for you, you won't even have the physical pleasures or, or pains. You'll lose consciousness altogether because consciousness exists to direct action, to direct mobility. So if the government starts thinking for you and acting for you, you'll just become like a plant, in which case there's no reason to live at all. So the right to think and act is how you maintain your life as a human being. All right, that's freedom. That's liberty. So life, liberty, and property. Why property? 
Because the right to liberty means nothing. The right to take action means nothing unless you have the right to the material consequences of that action. That is what property is. Property is the only implementation of the right to life and liberty. Liberty specifically. Or directly. Now, what the self-ownership people do is invert this hierarchy. They say no. Liberty is derived from property. You have a right to own things, including yourself, and therefore you have a right to do with yourself whatever you want. Well, there's a pretty big problem here. Because if you say, okay, I have the right to liberty. All right, well, how do you justify that? Well, because I have the right to property. I have the right to own myself, and so I can do what I want with myself. Okay, why do you have the right to own yourself? Where does property come from? No answer. It's just axiomatic. They can't ground it in anything. Now, if you have the correct view, the objectivist view, you say, oh, property? Well, that's just the right to the results of your action, which is the right to liberty. And the right to liberty, well, that comes from the right to life, because the right to life is the right to taking those actions that support your life. And life is just the basis of everything. That's the right to exist. You can't go any deeper than that. So, done deal. Now, you can't do that if you believe in the false theory of self-ownership. You have to say, liberty depends on property, and then property depends on no answer. You have to do what John Locke did, which is say, well, we're all really God's property, And so violating other people's rights is a violation of God's property rights. And why does God have property rights? How do we justify that? Well, he's God. We don't need to justify anything for him. He can do whatever he wants. You're going to criticize God's right to property? So this is just another way of saying, well, God, therefore. So where did the universe come from? Ah, we don't really know. We'll just say God did it. What's the origin of life? Ah, God. How do you justify the right to property? If, you've, if, if you can't justify it by liberty, you're justifying liberty by property. So you can't justify property by liberty. So where's property come from? Ah, uh, God. Okay. Now, this is a disaster. It sets up this system whereby the more you defend rationality, the more reason-oriented you are, the more you are attacking and tearing down rights. You see this all the time. I mean, leftists do this all the time. Even the so-called good guys, the skeptics, they all say, well, yeah, rights are an arbitrary postulate. They can't really be justified. They don't actually exist. Stefan Molyneux says this. All the skeptics say this. The left says this. They don't actually believe that anything Kim Jong-un does violates rights. Rights are just a subjective, arbitrary postulate. So the more rational you get, the further away from mysticism and supernaturalism you get, the less rights are respected. Or, the more you respect rights, the more irrational you have to get, the more religious you have to get, because God is the foundation of rights on this view. And you see what that has resulted in. We are living in that world. You know, there's a reason. (laughs) The less psychotically religious a conservative is, a Republican is, the more big government he is, and the smaller government he is, the more religious he is. This is why you have this impossible choice. You have people like Ted Cruz. He's one of the best on the role of government, but one of the worst on God. Now, ultimately, that the God part is going to win. I'm not saying you can trust Ted Cruz, because if you're seriously religious, you are not ultimately going to be able to implement capitalism. But there's a reason that all of the most religious people are the most capitalist. And it's because of this so-called esoteric philosophical issue of the hierarchy of rights. So this matters. If you don't understand what depends on what, then you get into this impossible situation we're in. And your choice is either Ted Cruz or, you know, all the weak Republicans. It makes all the difference in the world whether you can set reason and freedom against irrationalism and slavery. But if you 
divorce those two and give each side half, you get this impossible situation we're in today. And it is all a result of getting the abstract philosophy wrong. This has real consequences. Our entire political paradigm is a result of philosophical issues just like this. This isn't the only one, but this is a big one. And the whole question of politics is freedom versus slavery. And the question of rights is the question of freedom. So your answer to where rights come from makes all the difference. And if you give a bad answer, as libertarians and conservatives have, well, guess what you get? You get the libertarians and conservatives we have today. You get the best people being people like Ben Shapiro. The better you are, the more religious you are. So you're, you're trapped. And then the people who aren't religious are people like Trump. And uh, he is not a principled, small government, principled, individual rights kind of guy. I don't think he's ever... It would not surprise me if the issue of rights has never even occurred to him. Addendum. I am recording what you're hearing right now after I have recorded the rest of the episode a couple weeks ago. And I'm recording this because a few days before I'm about to put this episode up, Dave Rubin has interviewed Jessica Flanagan, a libertarian who, in the course of the interview, said something relevant to the subject of this episode. She said that she is in favor of universal basic income, massive taxation, and redistribution of wealth because, on the libertarian view, property rights have no basis, and therefore enforcing property is conventional. So there's no basis for enforcing property on the libertarian view, and so, redistribution of wealth can be a way of making up to people the coercion that is the protection of property rights. You go listen to this episode if you don't believe me. This is precisely the kind of thing you get when you don't know what you're talking about. Which is just another way of saying when you're a libertarian. If you don't know the basis of property rights, well, then you say... <sighs> These things have no basis, I guess, so imposing them on people is just an arbitrary kind of coercion, so we can make that up to people with uh, taxation and actual force. This is the kind of nonsense you get from libertarians. She said many other idiotic things on the show, but of course she did. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up because it was relevant to this and just a perfect example of the importance of the subject of this episode. If you have any questions, you can just send me an email at charles.a.2 at gmail.com. You can also visit my website at charles2.com. There you can find information on and links to all my work, including ways to support it. I don't hold my podcast or videos hostage to donations. You know, even putting it that way, I find distasteful. It's not hostage. <laughs> Charging for things is not holding them hostage, so I mean that in a lighthearted way, but I worry people will take it the wrong way. I hate people. You know how people do these joke advertisements? They'll They'll, they'll do real advertisements they're being paid for, but they feel uncomfortable about it. So they'll do the ad read ironically. Ugh, that disgusts me. How cowardly. Anyway, I don't have any ads, but I'd be fine with it. Although there are some problems with making money through ads, I think. I much prefer just to make money through voluntary contributions on Patreon. So if you find this valuable and you want to kick me a few bucks, you can do it there, and I appreciate it, and it helps give me the time to make more videos and do more commentary and understand things better and then explain those things to you. So contributions are appreciated, although I don't charge for the vast majority of what I do. I only really charge for the writing I do, and that's trivial. It's like $3 a month on Patreon, and I just let you have access to my essays. In any case, thanks for listening. Let's meet again in episode 34.